my life, I feel quite privileged. I feel like I have uh, a lot of wonderful spiritual brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers. And um, one of my uh, spiritual mothers who introduced me to Vilna, um, and her name is Catherine, and um, we went to Vilna's uh, sound therapy and healing center in Artepiespoort. And I will tell you a bit more about Vilna from the nice bio that I have in front of me. And, um, you know, she studied her first degree in music from the University of Pretoria. And then she spent nine years in England, where she gained an MSc a degree in the psychology of music at Keele University. And then she did her PhD on holistic approaches to healing with particular reference to stroke patients. And while she completed uh, a doctorate, she also qualified as a sound therapy practitioner through the British Academy of Sound Therapy. And, you know, she founded this uh, sound therapy center in 2007. So very welcome, Avril. Now we are Thank you. very looking forward you know, to this uh, wonderful talk with you. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. Um, I love sharing my passion with people, so you'll probably have to make me stop talking after a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then you can also mention that, you know, I've also started doing a sound healing course with Vilna and um, I'm really enjoying it. I'm so pleased. <laughs> okay, so shall I start or do you want to wait for more people? All right. We can start. Okay, so hello everybody and thank you so much that I can be here today to chat with you a little bit more about sound therapy and sound meditation. I'm going to share a screen with you for the PowerPoint presentation. While I do that, I'm going to um, close my video just to make sure that the data goes out um, easily. So let's get to the screen. Right. Um, a while back, EJ spoke uh, um, about the divine name and um, how we can chant it. So um, there's a way in sound therapy where we chant specific vowels that um, rebalance the chakras. And there's a, a combination of four of them the vowels for the crown, heart, sacral, and brow chakras. Um, when you chant them, it's believed that that um, uh, evokes the spirit, the energy, the sound of the divine name of Yahweh. So um, I did my voice warm-ups this morning and I recorded myself chanting it for you. Um, so the introductory meditation will be where... Um, I'm going to guide you in a little bit of a meditation and then I will play the recording for you. So if you can just make yourself as comfortable as possible where you are sitting. Notice the chair or the bed that you're sitting on. Notice how you are sitting. So simply notice where your feet are, your legs, notice the chair underneath you, the bed underneath you, wherever you're sitting. Begin to notice your breathing. Notice that the air you inhale is slightly cooler than the air you exhale.
So become fully aware of your body and your breath in this moment. In a couple of seconds, I'm going to switch on the recording of where I chant the divine name. What I'd like you to do while you listen to it is to imagine you are at the center of a ripple effect. So intend for the sound that you hear to actually come from yourself and as though you're at the center of the ripple effect. So intend for the sound to come from within and move outwards while you listen to it. It's for a period of just over two minutes. So after the toning, the chanting, I'll have just a couple of moments silence and then I will dong the Tibetan bowl and then you can open your eyes. So you can gently return your awareness to your physical surroundings. Take a breath in through your nose and sigh it out. So as I mentioned earlier, the divine name is a ch chanting of a succession of vowel sounds and in sound therapy and sound meditation there are numerous different sounds that can be used to 
rebalance um, the energy and then of course have the positive effect on the physical body as well. So let me just continue with the presentation. My screen seemed to have frozen, so if you just bear with me, I'm going to try start it again. There we go. Right. So when you look at that screen, at the top is the name of my center, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it later on. And the, the picture that you see there of the two tuning forks, it's actually a summary of my whole talk. Um, the image is about sympathetic resonance entrainment. It's a phenomenon in physics, which basically means where you have one vibrating object, such as the tuning fork on the left, um, when it has a direct vibratory effect on something else, which would be the tuning fork number B on the right. And the effect of the vibration from the one object on the other is such that it makes the other object vibrate too. Um, so in my talk today, I will share more information on the sound vibrations used in sound therapy and sound meditation, um, which are used to entrain people's energy to, to move back to what's called their blueprint healing frequency. Because stress and pollution causes us to, for our energy to actually move away from the blueprint healing frequency. And in sound therapy and sound meditation, we use different sounds to entrain your energy back towards um, healing. Here, I just want to um, come in and, and say, when I talk about healing, it's different from curing. Um, in the Western medicine, um, when a cure is not found for someone, it's seen as failure. Whereas in the more Eastern medicine, which is the belief used in sound therapy as well, um, healing is seen as a long journey. And whatever positive experience this a person has along the healing journey is seen as part of the healing. So I just remember when I talk about healing, it's not necessarily the same as curing. EJ, can you just give me a thumbs up to show that you still hear me? <laughs> Thank you. Right, here's a summary of my outline of my presentation. So I'll give a bit more info about sound therapy, sound meditation, and then also the importance of intention. I'll talk a bit about sound and the material world. So how do sound vibrations affect matter? I'll talk a little bit about sound and the living world and ask the question, is sound present in the process of creation? And then look a little bit at sound and architecture and something called sound frozen in stone. And then I'll just tell you a bit more about my center. Um, I can, I'm going to ask if there's any questions, if we can keep it for afterwards, please. So the use of sound for healing is as old as humankind itself. Um, for example, Pythagoras wrote specific scales for specific ailments. A scale in music is a succession of notes. So um, there were specific um, successions of notes, scales used for specific ailments. Um, in the Old Testament of the Bible, we read of how David soothed King Saul's fierce temper with harp music. Um, indigenous tribes to this day still use a combination of music and dance and plant medicine to reach altered states of um, consciousness. And then there's also the well-known story of how the walls of Jericho came down with the use of sound. So the effect of music and sound is undeniable. Um, 
and it can go either way. It can either have a good effect or a negative effect. And when I teach sound therapy and sound meditation, I encourage people to notice what sounds in their lives actually enhance their well-being and what sounds don't. And then if you can get rid of the sounds that do not enhance your well-being, then do so. And if you cannot get rid of those sounds, there are certain ways you can um, uh, positively affect your own energy to, to still allow those sounds, but then they have a bit less of a negative effect on you. Now, I mentioned earlier the vibratory principle of sound, sound therapy with the tuning forks. Um, so this is indeed the basic principle of sound healing. Everything is in a state of vibration, including our organs, our bones, our, the tissue in our body, and the energy field around us. So if any of these parts of the body or aura become unbalanced, in other words, ill, their symptoms may be relieved through um, projecting specific sound frequencies into the aura and the body um, to reach that state of sympathetic resonance entrainment. Now, there's certain sound tools that I use in sound therapy to, um, to reach this um, sympathetic resonance entrainment. And the first group of tools are there on this picture is the quartz crystal singing bowls. Um, they consist of 99% pure quartz crystal. So when you play them, you actually use the energy of crystal together with sound. And um, I always use the example when I was still doing my training in the UK. Uh, one Saturday, my husband and I decided, okay, it's time to clean the house. And we put a CD of crystal singing bowls on as background music. Within a few minutes, both of us were not in the mood for cleaning the house anymore. We just wanted to lie on the couch and relax. Um, these sounds are very powerful. They change your, your, your brainwave state. Um, they put you in the meditative state. So that's why they always say also, do not drive while you listen to these sounds. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the brainwave states uh, a little bit later. So those are the quartz crystal singing bowls. I also use Tibetan singing bowls, uh, sometimes called Himalayan singing bowls. They have a more earthy sound. They're made of metal. Um, they're normally used at the beginning of a session and in the crystal bowls later on in the session. I also use the shamanic drum, which is this kind of drum that you hold um, at the back. You can see there's um, strings at the back. This is where you hold it and then you play it with this um, stick. Um, if you look at pictures of traditional healers of a couple of centuries ago, so drawings, you'll see them with a drum in one hand like this. Um, that's why it's called the shamanic drum. The djembe drum, which is held between the legs, is not the traditional shamanic drum so just to distinguish between the two what makes this kind of drum that i use really nice for um, uh, guiding a group in sound meditation or for healing one-on-one uh, -on -one is the fact that you can hold it in one hand play with the other and walk around um, whereas with other drums you have to stay where you are and it's nice for a therapist also to walk around to move the, the sound around the clients. You've already heard uh, my voice in the beginning of, of this talk. Uh, the voice is an integral part of sound therapy. And um, the interesting thing is that when I did my training, don't kiss years ago in the UK, um, I had quite a big throat chakra blockage. The energy around my throat was quite blocked. And I still remember saying to my husband, um, when I'm trained, I'm not going to use my voice. I will use the bowls, but I will not use my voice. I'm just going to do it for the exams. And lo and behold, by the end of my training, my voice became my favorite tool. So obviously through my training, I released blockages around my throat that enabled me to really start to like using my voice. 
Um, anyone who has a voice can do sound therapy with their voice. It's got nothing to do with singing beautifully or anything like that. It's making specific sounds that have a soothing effect on your own body and those around you. And then last but not least, I also use tuning forks, um, which work on different um, uh, pressure points in the body. Sound meditation is the combination of meditation. I often use mindfulness meditation and then specifically using the sound tools to facilitate the meditation. So what you'll find when you meditate while one of these sound tools are playing, you will go into the meditative state much quicker because of the way that it works on your brain. And I will explain a bit more about that now. There are four main brainwave states. So at the very moment, you are hopefully in the beta brainwave state, which is the state where we are awake, which we are normally alert and we are conscious. Um, this is the state you have to be in when you drive, when you operate heavy machinery. Um, it's also the state that can cause you most stress. Because if you stay in the uh, beta brainwave state too long, that's where stress really starts to take over. So um, that's why we sleep. We first go through the alpha brainwave state into theta, which is the dream state, and then delta, which is the, the very, very deep sleep state. Um, why many people don't really feel relaxed after sleeping, there can be numerous reasons, but very often it can also be that they don't actually spend enough time in the alpha and theta states. The alpha theta border is the brainwave state where um, self-healing happens in the body and it's a kind of restful state that you don't get in any of the other brainwave states. Um, going close to the alpha theta border is also what happens when you receive a sound therapy treatment or when you receive sound meditation. Um, very often clients would tell me after a 45 minute session that it feels like they've slept for eight hours. It's because of the kind of rest that you experience. So in sound meditation and sound therapy, the tools that we use help to induce the alpha brainwave state, which is also known as the meditative state. And then you actually go a little bit deeper into theater, um, which we, we can also use something called journey work, which some of you might be familiar with, where you work a lot with people's uh, mental imagery um, which is a powerful tool also in, in meditation. Now, I believe any kind of healing has to be accompanied by positive intention. And that is also the case in sound therapy and sound meditation. Um, if you think for yourself, when you ask someone, how are you? You don't really intend to hear the answer. So you don't show the intention in your voice. Whereas if you ask, how are you? There's a clear difference in the way I ask it. So my intention comes through that I actually want to hear how you are doing. And that intention comes from the heart energy, if you look at this picture. Um, it's believed that the heart, um, we actually do a lot more through our hearts. The electric field, magnetic field around the heart is much bigger than around the brain. Um, so yes, the brain is very important, but we actually do a lot more through our hearts. And in sound therapy and sound meditation, we consciously work with positive love intention 
And we actually have a formula for that, which the well-known sound healer in America, Jonathan Goldman, that he coined. It's that vibration, in this case sound, plus intention equals healing. So this basically means that the sound on its own is wonderful and powerful. But when you add positive, loving intention, that's when the real healing comes in. Um, you can also pick up intention when you go to a music show of your favorite um, uh, artists performing. You, you can pick up whether the performer's hearts are in the show or not. And you will feel that through through your body if you really enjoyed a show it means that the performer's intention was for you to enjoy and they also had a good time if they don't have a good time or they have an off day that intention will come through and you will pick it up so it's the same with healing always remember when you work with sound put the positive healing out there i always call on the angels of sound love and light and trust that they are there um, to, to, to create the best for everyone involved. And with the importance of, of intention, also remember that words are also sounds. So combine them with different kinds of intention and you have different effects on your body. Um, notice more the words that you use. Uh, the words that those around you use. What intention is it used with? Um, I was raised with to always remember, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And that is very, very important in sound healing as well. So we're going to look a little bit at sound and the material world. So sound vibrations effects on matter. And here we look at the Schlatny patterns, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, Ernest Schlatny was a German physicist and musician born in 1756. He's called the father of acoustics, and he was the first scientist who did extensive research on vibrating plates and making sound visible. Um, there was a couple of researchers before him that did some tests with pastes on plates, but he was the main first researcher who, who did um, quite a lot of research. What he did was he drew a violin bow. If you look at the picture there on the left, he drew the violin bow on the side of a metal plate. And this plate was lightly covered with sand. And then this would cause the plate to resonate, to make a sound. And then the sand made a pattern depending on the frequency. So I'm going to show you now a short video clip of a teacher explaining this to learners. You'll see he uses a sound generator to send different uh, sound frequencies through a metal plate. He uses salt that he puts on the plate and depending on the sound frequency going through, the pattern on the plate actually changes. Oh, sorry. Previous, let's see. There we go. There's the frequency generator in orange.
I'll just explain a little bit more. That specific sound creates vibrations in the plate in such a way that where you see the salt, where that kind of um, square circle is formed, there is no vibration. So the sand collects where the salt collects where there's no vibration. So where there's no salt, it means that's most of the vibration takes place there. So this pattern here is repeated here and up there in that corner and there and there. If it were a bigger plate, you would see that this pattern repeats everywhere there. Um, so just to, to repeat also that where you see the salt is where there's no vibration. And as you could hear the sound change, the pattern changed. If you find the Irish accent a bit challenging, what he was explaining was that sound is um, um, a thousand hertz, one kilohertz. So that means the plate vibrates a thousand times per second um, up and down. I've seen this so many times and I'm still amazed every time I see it. And it's also important to remember that um, when you see this, it means every single sound you hear, every single sound you make creates geometric patterns in your body and in your energy field. And the more positive the sounds, the more beautiful these patterns. And the more positive the intention, the more beautiful they are too. So here's a whole list of um, the Schlatni patterns. If you look here at the top left, this is a low pitch sound. And as the pitch increases, the patterns increase until you eventually get to a really high pitch sound and you see the complexity of the pattern increased. So the higher the pitch, the faster the frequency um, and the movement of the plate, so there's more um, patterns that, that form on the plate as well. So Schlatni used um, a lot of powders like sand and salt and some pastes as well. Um, in modern day, 
there's um, um, a German guy, Alexander Lauterwasser, and he sends the, sa the same sound frequencies through water. So these pictures were taken, uh, this, the surface of water was, was photographed. Um, over here, 22.1 hertz was sent through the water and the light was shone on the water and this is the pattern that showed. And what's interesting is that all Lauterwasser's um, patterns in water correspond with Schlatny's patterns of a couple of hundred years ago with um, sand on metal. And here you can also see um, how the complexity of the pattern increases as the pitch goes higher. Here, top left, you have 22.1 hertz. You go up here, 1,339 hertz, much more complex. On this image, is what happens when you increase the amplitude, so the loudness of one sound. Again, this is by Lauterwasser, so it's sound sent through water. There's 512 hertz, and as it goes on here, the amplitude is increased. So that also um, uh, creates a little bit more chaos in the picture when you increase the amplitude. So if you listen to music, don't play too loudly because it can have chaotic effect on your energy if it is too loud. Now sound and the material world. Do sound vibrations play a role during creation? Let's look at this. It's a Schlatny pattern of the frequency of 10,101 hertz. And then we look there. There's not yet research that draws a direct link between sound and creation. But my personal opinion is that sound is present at creation. Um, I believe that sound, certain sound frequencies are present to, to help to create that specific life form in the way that it should be. Um, all the creation stories of around the world include something to do with sound. In the beginning was the word and the word was God. Um, so, as I said, there's not yet scientific research that draws a direct link between sound and creation, but I think we're not far away from that uh, research to prove it. Here are some more images. If you look at these Schlatny patterns, think a little bit of what it might make you think of. And there you have a tortoise shell. So this is actually called morphogenesis, shaping processes that occur in nature. This is the image of the sound frequency. And when you look at these flowers, you could begin to imagine that just maybe sound was present at their creation. Now when you look at sound and architecture, there's something called music frozen in stone. This is where researchers study old sacred sites and buildings and find interesting ways in which sound plays a role in that specific building. So we're going to look at two such buildings. The one is Newgrange in Ireland, which was constructed about 3,500 BC. And then the Rosslyn Chapel, which is made famous more with the Da Vinci Code book by Darren Brown. That's a chapel in Scotland constructed in the 15th century. So let's have a look at how music is frozen in stone 
in these buildings. On the left here is the entrance to the building known as New Grange. If you are to enter through that door, you enter this long winding corridor and then you arrive at that open space. Folklore tells us that the high priests used to stand at this center there and chant a specific frequency. And that would then be heard outside. Scientists found out that the dominant frequency inside the chamber is 110 hertz. When you chant 110 hertz frequency there of 110 hertz, the way that it moves through this tunnel is such that um, it makes a standing wave. So there, you, if you stand there, you don't hear the sound. If you stand there, you hear the sound. You don't hear it, you hear it. And the way that the sound travels along this corridor is such that it's, it's amplified to be heard outside. Interestingly enough, as I said, you see all these spirals outside the entrance. The Schlatny pattern for 106 hertz is a perfect spiral that's very close to 110 hertz. So now, is it possible? I believe so, that the people from those days knew that the sound they made created spirals as geometric pattern. The, the optimum sound to be heard outside this building would create spirals and that's why they decorated it with spirals. That's my opinion and my belief. Um, it just, it makes sense to me and I find it absolutely fascinating. Now the, the Rosslyn Chapel, I have a short video to show you. I'm nearing the end of my talk. In the Rosslyn Chapel are um, different pillars. And at the top of the pillars are geometric patterns. And a father and son team with the surname Mitchell um, decoded these patterns. They looked at the geometric patterns and they thought they look a lot like Schlackney patterns and they translated the patterns into sound. And that's the music that you will hear while we watch this video.
So if you look at this angel in the chapel, he's holding a music stave of five lines. And the, the fingers are pointing to B, C, A, la, la, la. That's the music we just heard. And the music we just heard is based on the geometric patterns that's found on those pillars. So um, I just find it fascinating how, for some other reason, the creators of this chapel wanted to um, put this music as a, a riddle inside the chapel um, for us to discover many, many years later. Right. So that was a little bit of more information for you about what sound therapy is, what sound meditation is, what role sound actually plays in our daily life. We've got sound vibration around us all the time and we need to become more aware of it. And as I said earlier, notice if there's sounds that don't do you good and try to change them if you can. Um, I just um, put a little bit of information there about the, the center that I, that I run. This is my YouTube channel where I'm um, posting um, my sound meditations. Um, lockdown has given me the wonderful opportunity to actually record my sound meditations and put it online. So my foundation training course and practitioner training course are both available online where I teach you how to use sound in a positive manner for yourself. Um, you don't have to use all the sound tools. If there's just one you want to focus on, that's fine too. I do some meditation coaching and distance Reiki um, as well. And then after lockdown, I'll get back to doing individual and um, group sessions. So, right, that's the end of my presentation. Okay. Ah, thanks, Wilna. Uh, this is quite fascinating. I have to say that, you know, it really opened our eyes, you know, to the deeper wonders of sound. Um, maybe before we open the floor, what I can also mention is that, uh, for those who might not know, is that we've um, been doing a, a few talks that really touched on the, uh, on the topic of sound. Uh, for example, we've had a lady called Trish who spoke about the Lord's Prayer, if you look at it in the original Aramaic. And what she um, really showed us is that, uh, you know, in the traditional Lord's Prayer, when we talk about hallowed be thy name, if we look at the uh, concept of name uh, in the original Aramaic, it touches on sound and vibration. And, you know, that was quite fascinating. And then we also, I also spoke about the divine name. And what we found there is that um, the name of God is encoded uh, in, uh, within our very DNA. And also uh, that, uh, you know, the, the divine name can be interpreted. Uh, so, yeah, that's quite fascinating. So what I'll do is uh, if anyone wants to ask a question or um, you know, uh, uh, make a comment, uh, please raise your hand or send me a message. And then, um, yeah, you can uh, un unmute yourself and um, looking forward to some more discussion. Thank you. So just an observation. Yes, glorious. The, um, I have had the pleasure of meeting with Masaru Emoto. Oh, wow. The man who did the water crystals. Yes. And we had a two hour conversation. And uh, to him, the, the power of the word plus the intention 
would actually be captured in the shape of the crystal. That's it, yes. Yeah, so yeah. that was wonderful. I've had the opportunity to also be in his home with Rupert Sheldrake. Oh, wow. We had a long conversation around what this does in the brain. Yes, it's uh, absolutely fascinating. The old idea of morphogenetic fields on the research and his wife, Jill Purse, is an authority on cymatics. That's it. I did some um, master classes with her when I was in the UK. She's also a formidable sound healer. So having your presentation on sympathetic resonance entrainment has brought back that rich, rich experience to me and I thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm so pleased. <laughs> That's glorious. Uh, I see also a comment from Jimmy and he says, uh, sound patterns were mapped mathematically by math mathematician and the founder of harmonic analysis, uh, Joseph Fourier. Okay. Yes, sound, music, maths, it's all um, interchangeable. Um, when you stay, it's, I think it will take you a few lifetimes to study everything about it. And every day they find more, more information about how the role of mathematics in sacred geometry and how that links with sound. It's phenomenal. And then I see Duarte Gonsalves uh, has raised a hand. Uh, so Duarte, please feel free to, to comment. Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, sorry, I'm a new member here. Um, I know Celia for quite some time from Waterkloof Parish. Um, uh, thank you, Vilna, for a very interesting um, presentation. Um, if you would allow me, um, there's um, a slide um, that I'd like to go back to um, because I'd like to offer an alternative um, uh, interpretation from a complexity point of view. It's the one with the circle and the chaos. The one with the? Circle, the circular pattern of, um, so the sound had formed a circular pattern with the chaotic center. Okay. It was um, the um, EJ, if you can just, Wasser, just after um, Lauter Wasser's um, um, patterns. This right. After, um, that, uh, if you if you know okay. which one I'm talking about, your slides weren't numbered. So I'm I'm not sure. Uh, I can't refer to a specific number. Let's see. The next one. Um, next one. With the amplitude. Is this the one? Yes, that one. So, um, let me just do this. Okay. So, um, if you look at that pattern, um, you'll see that it has um, structure to it um, in the form of the circle. And then at a certain um, uh, amplitude, you said this was um, in amplitude, right? Yes. Yes. So um, at a certain amplitude, it starts to break up in the center and you get this chaotic pattern. Um, so that has um, both um, chaos and order in it, right? Yes. And, and that also from a spiritual point of view has a um, very interesting meaning in that um, we have uh, ordered life we go into chaos and we reorder at a different level or, um, you know, in, in a different state of consciousness um, with, yes. with a new order. Sorry Absolutely. So if you look at that, it has both. There's um, order and chaos um, emerging at um, different amplitudes. Um, so that I thought was interesting just to mention um, because I'm um, also an, I'm an engineer, but um, I'm also uh, studying complexity um, in social systems. And um, okay. um, is um, the ordered and the chaos. Um, yes. So that um, if you want to, for example, transition from um, a state where you're stuck, you need to create some chaos in, in yourself yeah. um, to disrupt your normal patterns of thinking. Um, and okay. that's something that you're seeing um, in the physics there, um, which is also relevant um, in psychology and in social. Um, I just had a question in terms of. Uh the chakras. Some people say there are seven chakras. 
and some uh, talk about eight chakras. Do you have any particular view uh, about that? Um, traditionally, we talk about seven chakras, um, but as our uh, vibration actually changes to, as we move into the next dimension, um, newer chakras are activated in our energy field as well. So um, I work with an eighth one, the thymus chakra, halfway between the heart and the throat. So it's in the upper chest. Um, that's the eighth chakra along the spine that I work with. And then I also work with seven chakras in the, the aura, so transpersonal chakras. Um, there are different theories about the transpersonal chakras. Um, because they're a bit newer for people in their awareness, even though in the time of Atlantis, we commonly worked with them on a daily basis. Um, but yeah, so to answer your question about seven or eight, I work with eight chakras in, in the, along the spine. Yeah. Oh, it's just so fascinating. Thank you so much, Phil. Now I think, my goodness, could we please have a session every week for the next six months? <laughs> just to take all this in. It's just so fascinating. Thank you. Uh, last evening, I was going back to the sound of Aum, 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 yes. depending how slowly we say it and pray it and sing it and chant it. And I was just listening actually to one of the Indian uh, gurus explaining this to be the only sound with the three syllables a a or um that doesn't use the tongue at all now that's that's new to me i i don't know if soren is with us i've i've lost everyone on my screen here but if um if that's so it's a, a remarkable thing you know in, in terms of linguistics but the added aspect of, of listening to this, uh, this guru this, um, on, on YouTube was that how it has such a healing power. Mm. Just saying or praying or chanting. And I would imagine even, you know, internally, if one does it internally, it yeah. has a healing power that's been documented in many, many different ways. And he spoke about children having difficulties at school, for example. Mm. And I think if we were to tap into that sort of wisdom, you know, in the West, yes. we would find healing practically everywhere. Um, yes. The Aum is, is extremely powerful. It's the only sound that um, works on your whole aura in one go. All the other sounds are, uh, apart from the divine name, um, are specific individual sounds for specific chakras, whereas the Aum is like an all-rounder. Um, when uh, my son was born by um, um, emergency cesarean, and um, my husband always wondered how he would stay calm during the birth. Not me, him. Um, and. Uh, we were there in, in theatre. I had packed Robbie Williams' a CD for background music. I forgot it at home because it was emergency, blah, blah, blah. And suddenly my husband started to chant in the operating theatre. And he chanted the arm and he did overtone chanting. And both him and I were so calm and that's how our son came into this world. And uh, I distinctly remember uh, one evening, um, we, we had a, a serious discussion about things in the family, and my son was not even one year old yet. And while my husband and I were seriously discussing this issue, my son went, Aum, Aum, Aum. And my husband and I looked at each other and said, Yeah, he reminds us that there's more important things in the world. <laughs> Um, yes, the arm is, and when I do a group sound meditation, we chant the arm together as a group. Um, I call it the arm circle, and yeah, it's it's powerful. It's wonderful, wonderful. That sounds fantastic. I mean, the story of your son, it must have also been with him since birth, that yes. sound. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. And as a family, we also chant their arm regularly. Um, he, oh, he's now 11 and he still asks for it. He said, you need to chant the arm. Um, well, you know, we're, you know we, we, we think we'll be zooming in and out for several months on Mystic Matters because none of us know what the future is. And yes. even if we do go back to having small meetings, it won't be as, as many people as we have on Zoom. So I think, you know, looking ahead a little bit, uh, EJ and I are looking at the program ahead, we might then invite you back. We could have another session. Um, now that we've had the theory and, and trying to understand some of these concepts more, we could yeah. then have a session such such as that, something like that. It, it would be yes, wonderful. Yes, I'd love to. Thank love you. To. I'd love well, to. You. Yeah. Uh, well, now, so, a question from Gay. And I noticed, she, yes. Yeah, she wants to know, do you run courses on overtoning uh, separate from other courses? Um, I do. Um, if someone does my foundation course, it's part of the foundation course. Um, but if someone's already done a lot of voice work and they only want to do overtone chant, then I do that separately as well. Yeah. We did get a few uh, requests wanting to know about your uh, courses. And I think on the one email, um, EJ, we have that brochure and we've got the yes. website. Yes. Unfortunately, I think on the second email or one of the others that I sent, we didn't include the brochure. But I think for anybody who's interested to follow this up, you know, we can go to your website. Uh, Vilna, Absolutely. And and follow yes. it up there and also find out more from EJ. So, That's so EJ has all my contact details. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you very much. I don't know if there are more questions, EJ. I can't see much here. <laughs> don't see anything on this side. So okay. what we will do is um, I will also get the um, recording that Vilna made to the divine name and we will also send that to everyone. Uh, with a follow-up email uh, when I've uploaded this to YouTube. So if anyone who might have missed uh, our conversation today, if they want to catch up. And uh, what we will also do is we uh, see that uh, um, Duarte also sent us a, a link uh, on YouTube. So we'll also include that uh, in a follow-up. Well, thank, thanks a million for all of that, EJ. It's, it's wonderful. You can just click on those buttons so easily and they come zooming over to us afterwards because some of the people can't attend the Zoom. I don't know if any of you have seen that very funny snippet of the Zoom calendar. You know, everyone starts off by saying, oh, we now have time to enter within and find out about ourselves and live a quieter life, etc., etc." And then suddenly he gets out his Zoom calendar and all these Zoom meetings are coming one by one by one. And at the end, his friend is saying, when can I see you? And you see on the screen, Zoom calendar, and he has no time left. You know? So for us to get your emails, um, Ijo, with all the information and all the links, really, it's, we're, we're really very grateful for that. So I guess it's, it's time to say bye and many, many thanks again, Vilna, and many thanks for all of you coming. And uh, we hope to meet again on the 17th. We'll have the notice before that. Um, thanks. Did you want to say something, Claudius, or are you just waving goodbye? Just waving goodbye. <laughs> I can see four people here, so I wave goodbye to all of you, but the others, I'm afraid, you've got into the ether. So I'll just have to say bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Well, Thank you. Bye. Bye. bye.